Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is David Toretta. He's going to talk about his friendship with the great Chuck Berry. Yeah, Chuck Berry used to play uh, the Duck Room at a bar restaurant here in town called Blueberry Hill. And uh, he'd play there once a month, I think from 1996 to 2014 or somewhere around there. I'm not sure of the exact dates. Yeah, Chuck had a, a good relationship with the guy, the owner of Blueberry Hill, Joe Edwards. Blueberry Hill's kind of like um, a hard rock cafe before the hard rock cafe. It was sort of modeled after that. A lot of rock and roll memorabilia. Um, and at one point, Chuck uh, B- Joe Edwards was putting out a beer called Rock and Roll Beer. And uh, on the first can, he wanted uh, Chuck Berry on it. And they sort of began their relationship that way. Chuck went, well, you know, I think they were both feeling each other out. And uh, that went well. And then other projects came around and that went well and it sort of snowballed and they trusted each other. And eventually they set up a situation where uh, Chuck would play the the duck room in Blueberry Hill once a month. And that lasted from like 1996 to 2014. Uh, Joe did a lot to help Chuck's reputation around town. Um, I remember one time seeing Bonnie Ray out at the big amphitheater here and I think she was going for a, a cheap uh, applause or something. I, oh, all respect to her. And she, with respect, mentioned Chuck Berry. And I remember seeing a lot of people booing him. And it shocked her, me too. But uh, with Joe's help, they really brought back Chuck's good name. Um, and in fact, there's a statue out there in front of Blueberry Hill now uh, of Chuck Berry. And um, the city realized his uh, importance and um, came to embrace him. And a lot of that had to do with uh, Joe Edwards and showing the good side of Chuck. And they'd go to Cardinal games and football games and <laughs> kind of brought his statue, stature up in town. Did you play some of those Duck Room gigs with him? Yeah, I did. Uh, normally, you'd use a guy named Jim Marsalis, who was a touring bass player. But if Jim couldn't do it, I would play there with him, playing bass. And that was always a gas. Yeah, Chuck would have this dual showman's on 10 in there. It was, it was a small room, and uh, <laughs> you had to compete with that. <laughs> the instrumentation at the Duck Room would be Keith Robinson on drums. Um, he's a great drummer, really great guy. Chuck liked him a lot. Uh, Bob Lure on piano, also a really great piano player. And uh, usually his son... Uh, Charles Jr. on guitar and Ingrid on harmonica and uh, Jim Marsalis on bass. And uh, occasionally I'd get to do that. No, they'd never rehearsed. Uh, occasionally Chuck would come in and want to try a, a new song from their regular list and he just kind of tip warn them. <laughs> and uh, they'd have to go for it. That was great because you'd hear tunes um, you never can tell or some stuff that weren't usually on the normal repertoire. Yeah, there was always a great audience and they knew what they were witnessing. Uh, there was a lot of tourists that would be there. Um, uh, there was always a substantial St. Louis crowd, but there would always be a, a lot of people from out of town that would come just to see those shows. And they knew they were seeing royalty. <laughs> yeah, people from all over the world would be there. You know, and th- honestly, they weren't always the greatest performances. But people uh, didn't really care. They knew they were seeing Chuck Berry there. And they were hearing Johnny Be Good by the guy who wrote it. <laughs> Usually showed a lot of respect and realized what was going on. Now, his list uh, didn't normally have Promised Land in there, but he did do it on occasion. That was one of my favorite songs anyway. One of my favorite Chuck songs. Yeah. Um, Brown Eyed Handsome Man wasn't normally in there, but he'd do that on occasion. Um, you never can tell. He usually wasn't in there, but he would do that on occasion. Actually, he'd like to do blues there, which I think maybe not everybody in the audience wanted to hear, but uh, he'd go in and do some deep blues cuts. Yeah, his last show, I believe, was in 2014, and you um, he, he could tell he wasn't feeling really well. And um, I'm not sure if it was that show or the show before. Um, actually, I was... Yeah, well, it must have been the one before, because I was actually playing bass on it. And at one point, 
um, he wouldn't feel too good. And and rather than you know call the show short, um, he put down his guitar and um, got a chair and started reciting some poetry. <laughs> and uh, it was amazing. And uh, and the audience was just dumbfounded and awestruck. And, uh, but he. He wouldn't uh, sell the audience short. He wanted to do his whole show, and uh, and he did poetry, the, some things he wrote, and uh, it was fantastic. So the yeah, pro probably the next month was his last show, and um, you could tell he wasn't feeling really good. And um, I don't think he knew it was going to be la his last show. I think he just decided we're going to take a break for a month or two. So he started feeling better and. Uh, he never came back after that. How did you hear about his passing? Um, I, I was pretty close with everybody involved. Um, we knew it wasn't doing too good. And uh, I probably heard it on the radio like everybody else. Or, but uh, I, I'm good friends with Joe Edwards, and uh, he, we knew something was up. And Chuck's, Chuck's funeral was quite the ordeal. They had it at um, another venue that Joe Edwards is involved in called the pageant. And um, they had a private ceremony, but they also opened up this one to the public and um, they filled uh, the pageant up. And uh, it was quite an event. I saw Paul Schaefer in line, uh, Rolling Stones sent the big bouquet of flowers. Um, people in the band got up and talked and um, it's pretty crazy. 